All right, can everyone see the CEREC screen? Fantastic, so here's our scan that we took. Now you'll see um, some radiographic markers in this scan that represent that reference body which was held in the mouth by that yellow appliance that I fabricated. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna launch that 2D uh, image into the 3D environment, which is the Galaxis Galileo's implant environment. And it's within this software that we can evaluate the clinical uh, anatomy, also map the nerve, we can import the CEREC restoration, which we had designed earlier, and also uh, fabricate our uh, insert for the surgical guide. So what I'm going to be doing first, I think if you remember, the protocol that I follow in my practice is to always start with the tooth first. So importation of the CEREC restoration within the software is fantastic and it's easy. There's a CAD CAM tab here on the lower right hand side. When we click on the uh, CAD CAM tab, you can open a file and you want to browse for the file that's appropriate. We exported this at an earlier stage, if you recall. And so we're simply opening up that CEREC CAD CAM file, Deb, as you can see here. And this is the tooth that I envisioned for uh, site number 20. Now for the rest of the audience, as I'm doing this, I'm actually having my consultation with Deb in the chair. So I'm going to show you real time what the discussion is while I'm treatment planning this patient. So we'll pretend like this is actually happening in my practice. So this is the tooth that I think is best going to fit that space, Deb, that you have. Now obviously you had a pediatric tooth or a baby tooth that was there that needed to come out. That baby tooth happens to be much larger than the premolar that you were missing. So in the software for the rest of the clinicians, you can see that the tooth was labeled as 19 so that CEREC can actually design the appropriately, appropriately shaped tooth for that edentulous site. We can relabel that just for uh, numbering purposes and documentation purposes to tooth number 20, which is really what tooth we're replacing for Deb. Once we've opened up the CAD CAM SSI file, the very next screen allows us to register the data sets. The data set that you see on the left is an optical impression from CEREC. It's surface detail of the clinical crowns of the teeth, but also the soft tissue that the patient presents with. The data set on the right is the radiographic data from the Galileos, which we just took. Now the software um, allows us to uh, match the data sets together, but we have to specify specific markers on common anatomic points. So I'm double clicking on tooth number 21 in the CEREC data, and I'm also double clicking on a similar point of the clinical crown in the radiographic data for tooth number 21. I'll do the same thing for tooth number 22. And the software really only needs two markers for each data set, but I like to add a little bit more so that the software has a better understanding of how the data sets match together. I'm simply going to click next and we'll let the algorithm match the data sets together. The very next screen that pops up is a screen that requests us to verify that the optical impression is correctly aligned with the x-ray data. The way we do this is we simply scroll into the cross-sectional uh, view here and we scroll through the volume using that slicing window and make sure that the yellow outline of the CAD CAM data is matched perfectly with the, yellow, uh, with the clinical crown of the radiographic data set. So you can see that the data sets have matched up very, very nicely here. Now, one thing I'd like to show everybody is the benefit of having both of these data sets. When you're looking at the clinical situation, one thing that's missing in radiographic data is soft tissue anatomy. When we look very closely, you can see that the yellow outline of the CAD CAM file is matching very nicely with the radiographic data that, um, from, that came from the Galileos. You'll see that the yellow line actually falls off close to the gingival anatomy. And this yellow outline is correct. It's actually data that uh, is really critical in my opinion when it comes to anterior zone implant planning because it allows us to understand the thickness of the tissue and the biotype of the tissue that we're dealing with. So it allows us to truly assess the patients from all standpoints, from the tooth itself to the anatomy and the topography of the gingival architecture to obviously the radiographic data provided by cone beam. What I'll do at this stage is show the audience how the data set has actually matched up correctly. And Deb, you can see here that 
the tooth is matched very nicely with the remaining dentition, the rest of your teeth. And this is what we propose that this tooth would look like once we're actually done with placing the implant. And once the implant has healed, this is what we envision the tooth will look like. And hopefully that's an accurate representation of what you would like to have done, okay? Now that we have the restoration in the file, we can absolutely dial in and look at, um, for example, vital anatomy that you know, we certainly need to be aware of prior to considering an implant. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take the slicing window and I'm going to map the nerve for the audience uh, just so you can see how easy it is to map the nerve. The first thing that I do is I move my slicing window over the posterior mandible where the nerve enters the mandible on the lingual border. And I'm going to activate the nerve mapping tool using this icon right here underneath the nerve function. I'm going to plot my first point within that canal space. And then I'm going to drag my slicing window along the border of the mandible. And I'm going to look at that definition of the cortical, uh, cortical bone that lines the, the canal space itself. And so I'm going to simply map, map the nerve here following the anatomy. I'm going to take my time, especially when we get close to looking at where the nerve is in relationship to site number 20. And as I get close to the mental foramen, I sometimes like to switch modes, get out of the panorama mode, and look at the cross-sectional mode, and observe where that nerve actually exits the mandible through that mental foramen. There we go. And so very quickly, what I've done is I have essentially mapped the nerve, as you can see here in the 3D model. OK. At this stage, I'm actually ready to plan my implant. But prior to doing that, what I'd like to do is show the functionality of the CAD CAM tab. It's easy for a clinician to um, hide and remove the optical impression in order to evaluate the restoration and its relationship to the anatomy. And we'll switch right back into the full-blown software. And look at the crown in the, the cross-sectional view. And we can see the outline of the crown here relative to the anatomy. When I toggle on the model, you'll see the thickness or the biotype of tissue that I'm working with relative to the hard tissue here. Within the software, we have multiple ways of placing implants. We can certainly use the implant tab, as you see here on the right-hand side, to initiate the implant placement. But since we've actually integrated a CAD CAM file, there's an option to do the same thing within the CAD CAM tab. When we actually do it this way, what we're able to do is plan the implant. And this is the library that actually allows us to uh, discuss with patients what the options might be, not only in terms of diameter and length of implants, but also the vast library of implants that are options to us that are already built into the system. And you can see it's a pretty, pretty uh, expansive list of implants that have uh, been integrated with the Serona implant software. Uh, what we've planned for placement today is an Astra implant. You know, uh, usually we uh, like to consider a wide body diameter implant in the posterior. So we'll certainly start with a five millimeter diameter implant. And let's start with a nine millimeter and see what that does for us when the implant is actually placed within the software here. Now the implant will drop automatically underneath the restoration as you see here. And I'll zoom in for everyone's benefit. But at this, at this stage, what I can really do is I can move the implant, and I can translate the body of the implant and rotate the implant as needed based on the restorative vision that I've outlined for this patient. Now, you can see that this implant is placed flush with the crest of the bone, and we actually have a good amount of distance from the inferior alveolar nerve. So what I'd like to do is lengthen this implant. And the way we can do that is click on the implant tab. There's a drop down menu where we can certainly look at our options in terms of the appropriate lengths that this implant system has available um, to us. And I'm going to go with a 5 by 11 implant, as you can see here. 
Okay, so let's assume that this is the uh, ideal location for my implant, both from a mesiodistal uh, standpoint, but also from a buccolingual standpoint. And keeping in mind that uh, the long axis of this implant restoration is right through the central groove, or maybe even slightly towards the buckle, which was most appropriate in terms of a functional um, evaluation of this restoration to direct the long axis down the long axis uh, of the implant itself. What I'll do at this stage is make mention of what the purpose of making that scanning appliance was. When you look closely in the 3D environment, you see the fiducial markers that were embedded inside of that reference body. And if you remember, the reference body was shaped like a T-shaped uh, uh, bar. That reference body um, contains these glass soda beads. And these radiographic markers are important because it helps the software understand the relative location of the planned implant relative to the block that we're about to mill. In order for us to make sense of everything, we have to first identify this reference body within the software. And the way that's done is by clicking on the implant tab and clicking on this R for the reference body. When you click on that, you have the ability to go through a software uh, menu pop-up menu that allows you to identify these uh, fiducial markers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on a fiducial marker and the software will automatically encircle that uh, fiducial marker as you guys can see here. Now it does require that we identify three of these fiducial markers that are within that reference body. And so I'm going to go ahead and identify three and it'll automatically detect the reference body at this stage. Once the reference body has been detected appropriately, I'm going to click on the sleeve location. Okay. Now this is one of the trickiest things when you're working with CEREC Guide. Traditionally, everything that I'm showing you here is managed by CCAT, especially if you were to use the Classic Guide and the Opti Guide. The benefit is that it's quite honestly a nice system of checks and balances. They have the ability to um, design the location of this master sleeve within the surgical guide. And it's CCAT who's responsible for setting these distances uh, that allow us to understand the drilling protocol as specified by the implant system that we've selected. What I'm actually going to do is do all of that myself because with CEREC guide, I'm ultimately responsible for designing the guide from start to finish. And what we have to understand is what drills we have available knowing that we're using an Astra implant. Well, Astra Im implant drills come in the sizes of 14 millimeters, 18 millimeters, 22 millimeters, and 25 millimeters. My preference is to use the 22 millimeters in this clinical situation. And so I'm going to set my D2 sleeve position as 21 millimeters. Now the reason we want to set this one millimeter short of the drill is because I'm going to introduce a key during the surgery and that key is going to narrow the diameter of the hole um, to accept the osteotomies in a sequential pattern. Now the reason I have to measure this one millimeter short is because the key has a dimension to it as well and that dimension happens to be one millimeter. So I'm going to have my D2 setting as one millimeter shorter than my final drill length. And when I've done that, I can click OK. And now we can make sense of everything here. You'll be able to identify this reference body. I'll clip the volume here so we can see that. So here's our reference body in the mandible as it si is, is seated in the yellow wafer, which obviously doesn't show up because it's not a radiographic material. But we can at least see the relative position of that um, compared to the planned implant. At this stage, we are actually ready to completely mill the insert. Before I do so, let me show you what we're looking at here. We're looking at a cross section of the implant. We're looking at the, uh, the virtual restoration, which is outlined in blue. You're also seeing an outline of the reference body. But an important factor to notice is this orange line that comes directly perpendicular to the long axis of the line that extends off of the implant. This line right here is the top 
of the surgical guide, the platform of the surgical guide itself. And that's a distance from this line to the bottom of the implant as 21 millimeters. By the time I introduce a key on top of this, it'll be 22 millimeters, and that's how we calculate our drilling depth. Angulation will be completely controlled by the way that the CEREC mills this insert. So at this stage, I'm actually ready to produce my surgical guide. So I will simply go over to the surgery tab. I'll click on this icon, and this icon allows me to order or use the surgical guide manufacturing process. My three options for CCAT are to order a classic guide. If I had scanned the patient with a plate instead of that reference body, I could simply order a classic guide. If I had taken a full arch optical impression, I could simply upload the radiographic data plus the optical impression through this OptiGuide process and send it digitally. And we can also still do the OptiGuide without having to take an optical impression, but in this case, you would have to send a stone model. And last but not least, the third-party processing, as you see here with this giant R, is meant for an exportation of the reference body uh, so that the CEREC can actually mill that component uh, for the CEREC guide process.